The movie opens up by a quite famous man called Steve Jobs walks up on stage at the Apple Town Hall in 2001 for a staff meeting. He tells them that Johnny, himself and a small team has developed a secret device that will revolutionize the entire music industry. Steve explains it's a tool for the heart with which you can have a thousand songs in your pocket, and as he picks it up and shows them the iPod, people make a standing ovation. To the iPod. Twenty-seven years earlier, Steve meets his friend Daniel at Reed College. He explains to Daniel he doesn't want to study because a system can only produce a system, which he doesn't want to be part of. A teacher confronts them and wants to talk to Steve, asking if he's interested in taking an electrical engineering degree, but Steve says it's a waste of his time and money and that it's only for people who want job security. He walks up to a girl and comments her work is beautiful and she introduces herself as Julie. Next, the two have slept together, and Julie offers him some drugs, and Steve asks if he can get a couple to give his girlfriend. Later, he is with his girlfriend Chrisanne and his friend Daniel out in nature, being influenced by drugs. Suddenly, Steve starts hallucinating and begins hearing music, and goes out into a field. He becomes inspired, and starts visioning what he will do next. In the following weeks, he goes to calligraphy classes to learn form and precision, and to classes about computers to learn computer programming and engineering. His friend Daniel goes to meditation classes and Steve joins him. Inspired by the Indian culture, the two travel to India together to learn the concept of becoming happy by living an uncomplicated and simple life. Daniel asks Steve what he will do when they return to the United States, but consumed by thought, Steve doesn't answer him. Two years later, Steve works at Atari, developing games. He yells at a fellow employee that he can't design stuff, and then yells to the people at the company they can't design anything. His boss says people are complaining about his behavior and his odor, asking if he has showered lately. He tells Steve he wants him there because he's really good, but explains that he's an asshole. Steve asks if he can get his own project, saying he will make the best damn game he's ever seen. His boss accepts and promises a payment of $5,000 if he can deliver. Steve is working at night and is struggling. He calls his friend Wozniak, who gladly helps him, saying he loves this kind of job. Wozniak asks what they are paid and Steve lies, saying $700, which Wozniak thinks is great. Next, Steve's boss is ecstatic. Steve's comes home to Wozniak and gives him $350 for the work. Suddenly, Steve sees a device and asks Wozniak what it is. Wozniak says it will be very cool when finished, explaining he's developing and programming a computer terminal board that he's plugged into the TV. Wozniak tells Steve it in theory will display anything you're working on. As he is shown how it works, he becomes totally hooked on the invention. Steve later explains this is the wheel it's the industrial revolution. He says that to see what you're working on while you're working on it, that's freedom. Wozniak responds he's overreacting and that people don't want computers. Steve then asks rhetorically, how does somebody know what they want if they've never even seen it? Steve forces Wozniak to present it at homebrew. Wozniak says they need a name for the computer and after several ideas, Steve suddenly says Apple it's simple but sophisticated and it comes high up in the phone book. Apple? The fruit? Simple but sophisticated, it comes before Atari in the phone book too. Apple? Really? Apple? Come up with some better with change. Wozniak is a bit unsure if it's good enough, but Steve says they should go with it and see if it sticks. Wozniak presents the computer board, but most of the audience seem uninterested. Steve runs out, but is stopped by a man outside called Paul, who saw their presentation and who wants to talk business. He asks Steve to come by his store to talk. The very next day, Steve goes to visit Paul in his store. He starts negotiating and ends up receiving an order of 50 computers for $500 each, paid at delivery. Paul wants the order in 90 days, but Steve promises to deliver in 60. He and Wozniak get to borrow his parents' garage for their shop. Just as Wozniak finishes the first board, Steve comments they must make it more symmetrical. Wozniak says they don't have time and that no one cares, but Steve replies he himself cares. Soon after, Steve has employed Daniel and two other people he knows. Wozniak tells him they can't afford to pay them, and Steve says they can't even pay themselves unless they deliver, which is much more likely if they get help. During the following two months, the team creates all the 50 computer boards. As they make their delivery, Paul says he ordered computers with keyboards and monitors included, not just boards. Steve says these are kick-ass computers, but then Paul explains people don't want to assemble their own computers, they want to just plug it in and have it work, and Steve takes note of his comment. Steve then promises the boards will sell and says he can sell the other parts separately, which will make him more money. Paul says he will try selling them, but if it doesn't work, he won't make another order. Steve says it's okay, but adds enigmatically he thinks he will be very interested in their second model. Next, Steve has asked an experienced engineer to help them, 
telling him they need to fit a board, power supply, and cooling system inside a very small box and he agrees to help, even though he thinks it's impossible. To redesign. Redesign what? The power supply. This size. My rate is $200 a day. Are we clear? We're clear. Steve begins making calls, trying to sell their ideas and products to companies, but no one seems to be interested. As Steve becomes angry at some of his employees for not working as hard as they could, a man in an expensive car pulls up outside their house. He asks if this is Apple Computers, which Steve confirms. The man introduces himself as Mike and then says a friend from Atari asked him to stop by and visit to see what they are doing. They begin talking, and Mike says he's been looking for something to sink his teeth into, and is willing to invest, thinking they are onto something big. He says he will begin investing $90,000, and Steve's friends are blown away, but Steve says it's not enough saying he wants Mike to also kick in a $250,000 credit line with 10% interest that will be paid back in full at net revenue positive. Mike slowly says okay, and agrees to his terms, shaking their hands. Next, his girlfriend Chrisanne tells Steve she is pregnant and Steve reacts, saying she can't put this on him right now. As Chrisanne tries to say it's his child too, Steve yells it's not and tells her to get out of his house. Steve goes into a room and looks himself in the mirror, tucking his shirt into his jeans. Meanwhile Chrisanne tells Daniel Steve is kicking her out and Daniel assures her she has done nothing wrong, but that Steve has changed. A couple months later, Steve arrives at a computer fair, seemingly having changed and Paul sees him. Everyone at the fair listens as Steve begins presenting. He introduces the Apple II to the world, which he says will revolutionize the PC market and people start cheering. My name is Steve Jobs, future Apple II. Three years later, Steve arrives at his company. He explains to a team he's working with to create a computer called Lisa that they have to start over and make this interface revolutionary. One employee says Steve's ideas are not a pressing issue, and Steve yells at him that he is fired. Another employee says that the guy was the best programmer they had, and Steve replies angrily he was the best programmer that doesn't share their vision. Later, Steve's lawyer asks Steve to sign a paper saying he's Lisa Brannon's father. Steve says he never had a child with Chrisanne, but after his attorney implores him to sign it, he does. Next, Wozniak asks Steve why he didn't give Daniel and the others any stock options in the company and Steve responds his job is not to make people happy, but to make them better and that they do not deserve it. Wozniak shares that he once joined the company because building computers was his thing, and because he and the others thought it was cool. He tells Steve he has changed, and Steve says it's because he's growing up, but Wozniak replies he is not. The next day, Steve shaves his beard, and on the news, Apple Incorporated is making headlines as 4.6 million shares were sold in the first hour of its IPO. As Steve arrives at work, people greet him with applause. Two years later, board members are complaining how much Steve is spending on developing new tech and how he is mocking other big tech companies. They tell Mike that they will take the Lisa project away from him. As Mike informs Steve, he becomes furious. At home, Steve has received a letter from Lisa Brennan, asking if she can see him. Mike calls telling him he should look into an R&D project he approved some time back. Steve arrives to a room and asks if this is the Macintosh team, which they say it is. He asks where their boss is, but they don't know, and Steve says he will take over the project from now on. They show him their current build, but say it's all crap. Steve's old friend Chris arrives, who's part of the team and Steve remarks it will be fun working with them. He starts an inspirational speech, saying the Macintosh will be made for everybody, the small kid in school, and even the old grandma living in Nebraska it must be simple. Suddenly, the boss called Jeff walks in, telling Steve they are doing just fine without him. Steve then explains they don't do fine, they don't stop accepting things and they don't stop innovating. Steve says he doesn't want to take Macintosh from him, but tells Jeff he either gets on board or gets out. Steve then brings Bill with him to recruit all the best engineers and programmers in the company to help build the Macintosh. After several months, the team has developed and assembled the Macintosh and Steve says it's insanely great. It's insanely great. The board member called Arthur says the Macintosh side project has gotten out of hand, having costed millions. As they are selecting a new CEO, Steve suggests getting John Scully from Pepsi Cola since he has a marketing background and can help them market the Macintosh. Next, Steve Jobs is showing his staff the all-new Macintosh video ad for 1984, developed with the help of Scully and people absolutely love it. Some day later, the Macintosh team shows Steve Microsoft's new software, which is a blatant ripoff, and Steve asks to get Bill Gates on the phone. Next, Steve has a real nasty conversation with Bill, saying he will sue him for every cent he has ever made and make it his life mission to destroy him. Board members remark the Mac is not selling as Steve promised and Steve says it's not his fault, but Scully's. 
Steve explains Scully raised the price on the Mac so that consumers can't afford it, and so they will have to blame bad sales on Scully. Some time later, Wozniak enters Steve's office one evening, saying he is leaving Apple for good, and Steve asks why. Wozniak just answers they both knew this would eventually happen. He comments he remembers back when they were just kids in his parents' garage, saying it has been a journey, and tells Steve that he loved what they created. I'm leaving Apple. Why? I don't remember the last time we talked. I don't remember when we were just kids, back in your dad's garage. Always for people like us, you remember that? It's gotta be lonely, and it doesn't end well for you. As Steve gets to work early one day, he is surprised to see board members having a meeting without him. They tell him it's good he joins them this time, and Scully tells Steve he finds it difficult to do his work because of him accusing him of everything bad. At a board meeting a few days later, the board votes Steve Jobs out of the company. After Steve has left, they ask themselves what they will do now. Those in favor of John Scully? All in favor of Steve Jobs? Scully. Now what do we do? Steve goes to his parents' home, taking a look in the garage, remembering Apple's humble beginnings and his father comes and hugs him as he sheds a tear. Several years later, Apple's stock has eroded, Scully has been fired, new board members have joined Apple, and Steve's new computer company called Next, has entered buyout talks with Apple. The year is 1996, and Steve is at home, waking up his daughter Lisa. His new wife Loren asks if he has plans today, and he answers Gil Emilio, the CEO of Apple, will stop by, and they will talk a bit. As the two meet, Gil asks Steve what they can do to convince him to get back to Apple. Steve remarks Apple is four months away from insolvency and the stock set another record low, saying they must be desperate if they want him to help. Gil asks Steve what he needs, telling him to name it, anything he wants. Next, Gil and Mike meet Steve at Apple headquarters. Mike offers to show him the premises, but Steve soon tells him he will show himself around. Steve walks through the place and people look at him. He asks some guys and gals designing products why they are still working at Apple and a guy named Jonathan explains there are those who still believe in what he and Apple stood for quality, ideals and heart, hoping the company will embrace those ideas once more. Outside later, Steve is listening to music, commenting the music player is junk. He meets the chairman Ed Woolard, who tells Steve he is his friend and that they want him there. Steve says he is already there as a consultant, but Ed means he wants him as the CEO, saying Gil, the current CEO, can easily be voted out. Mike tells him that, if he wants back what he lost, this is his chance and Steve replies he never lost Apple, it was stolen from him, and leaves them, throwing away the music player. Steve meets Jonathan again, who shows him some design ideas. As Steve tells Jonathan a crazy idea he has, Jonathan replies Gil and the board will never allow them to do that. Steve then responds they are not going to ask for permission. Next, Gil tells the board they should relieve Steve from his advisory role in the company, and the others agree. Ed then lets Steve talk, and Steve begins explaining his vision for the future of Apple, saying they must not become better than Microsoft or Dell, but become different. Also, they will build the next generation of Macintosh, and kill every other project everything saying Apple won't make crap anymore. In short, they will make Apple cool again. Steve then says he can only do this if he is given permission to operate under full autonomy, if he become a voting member of the board and lastly gets Gil's position as CEO. Gil gets angry and the board votes on the matter. Steve receives full support from the board, and Gil is voted out. Next, Steve goes to one board member after the other, firing them and giving them golden parachutes. Lastly, Mike is given the same golden parachute. Mike shares he once told himself he would be out of the company while he was still in his 30s. He says he is now practically an old man, and accepts the golden parachutes and leaves. The two board members left asks what they are going to do now, and Steve says they are going to make a dent in the universe. In the last scene, Steve gives an inspirational speech, explaining that the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world, are the ones who do.